Both Kate Jennings and Shelley Gare make welcome returns to the Sydney Institute. Both have been here on several occasions before, and of course, some years ago, Kate Jennings gave our annual lecture, and a copy of that lecture is uh, in in her book, which um, Trouble, which um, Janet Grund is selling copies of tonight. So I'll introduce our speakers very briefly, because they're well known. Kate Jennings is an essayist, a novelist, author most recently of Trouble, Evolution of a Radical, and Shelley Gare, an editor, a columnist, and author most recently of The Triumph of the Airheads. And the topic tonight is Trouble, the Art of Sticking Your Head Above the Parapet. And we're going to start off with Shelley Gare and then go to Kate Jennings, and we'll have questions and discussion and finish no later than 7 o'clock. Shelley Gare, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Kate, for inviting me along tonight. And thank you all for coming along. Trouble. It's such a good word, and it gets such a very bad press. Kate and I took about three minutes over the internet deciding what we were going to call this talk. And Trouble is a natural, given what her, the name of her book. And the art of sticking your head up above the parapet, because that was probably the first thing that bonded Kate and me when we met in the mid-90s. A real respect for people who have the guts to speak out and who don't tow the accepted line. Kate writes in her preface to Trouble, it was said of George Orwell, who irritated the heck out of his comrades on the left, that he was skilful at rubbing the fur of his own cat backward. Precisely. <laughs> it's an admirable trait, and I actually like cats. Kate and I also discovered that we shared a profound distaste for postmodernism, for tosh and nonsense. But before we head down that merry path, here's the first dilemma. The real trouble with troublemaking is that you never know how much trouble you're going to get into. <laughs> when I was six, I was one of 16 little ballerinas performing in the end of year Christmas gala in the town hall of Geraldton. It's about 600 kilometres north of Perth on the coast. And we all danced on, on, onto the stage in a very strict formation, two lines of eight girls, dancing arm in arm in a polka down towards the front of the stage whereupon the littlies, getting to the front of the stage, saw the audience and freaked. And they were supposed to turn right, and they turned left. And I was in the row about three back, and I said, we're going the wrong way, you have to go right, not left. At which point, all the ballerinas panicked, and there were little girls in pink running all over the stage, it was absolutely complete chaos. And, you know, the audience just loved it. Fortunately, it was at the beginning of the Christmas holidays, so I had seven weeks to pretend it never happened. But in retrospect, though, it might have been better I just kept my mouth shut. Did it matter if we went right instead of left, left instead of right? But I know that the six-year-old Shelley Gare could no more not have cried out, we're going the wrong way, than a 21-year-old Kate Jennings could not have given the excellent and provocative speech she gave in 1970 at an anti-Vietnam demonstration. Instead of preaching peace, she turned a caustic rage on the men in the protest movement. She had realised, as had many other young women about that time, that the freedom-loving guys were fighting for civil rights, peace in Vietnam, justice, but they mostly thought of women as being there just for two things, typing and screwing. And Kate ended her speech with a rousing all power to women. There was ugly heckling. She was told, get on your back. Nice. So much more fun lay ahead of you, Kate. <laughs> I want to say early, by the way, that troublemaking and sticking your head up above the parapet, I'm not talking about people who stir for no other reason, maybe out of cruelty or malice or <coughs> jealousy or just general boredom. I'm really talking about people who see that something is out of whack, that the emperor is wearing no clothes. I'm also going to call them in this talk, for the sake of brevity and clarity, troublemakers. I know there's probably a much less aggressive way of describing them, but life is short. It is also full of folly, I think now more than ever. Peace and prosperity seem to bring that out in humans, more's the pity. Bring on the troublemakers. They are the safety valve of society. We need them and have always needed them to stick their heads above the parapet and say, hey, I think something's wrong. The camp, I think, seems to break down into two kinds of people. You get the ones like Germaine Greer and John Pilger, Giles Corrin, Boris Johnson in the UK, and these are people who seem to be known from a very early age that they wanted to cause trouble, and they actually revel in it, dancing up there on the parapets. And then there are the ones who just can't help themselves. 
They're the type of people who go along to a meeting or a conference and they stand up and they say something they fervently believe that they should say. And, um, or they maybe write a memo to the boss and they copy it to everybody and then they get on with life. They start thinking about what they're going to have for lunch, what they're going to have in their sandwich. Maybe they'll have chicken, maybe they'll have tuna. At which point somebody walks in and says, that was so courageous of you, that was so brave what you did, that was so honest. And the sandwich thinker goes, shit, what did I say? <coughs> In fact, Kate herself writes in trouble that she hadn't read her moratorium speech for 35 years, and when she did reread it, as part of preparing this collection, she was staggered. She said, holy shit. <laughs> so what is it that produces the kind of person who's always opening their big trap to set the baby ballerinas right? Nature or nurture? Whatever it is, it has to be said up front that the troublemaker's lot is not always a happy one. Society finds them awkward. They get in the way of money-making schemes, of ruthless cost-cutting and downsizing. They point out that pie-in-the-sky schemes don't work, and nor do pigs fly. Emperors don't like having their nudity pointed out to them. I've caused a little bit of trouble in my life, not, as much, not nearly as much as Kate. And a former editor of mine once said to me, with some fondness, I might say, you know, Shelley, by the way, before I keep on going, I did actually check about the expletives with Gerard, but you did say it was fine, so I'll keep going. Yeah. Um, a, well, former, <laughs> a former editor of mine once said to me with some fondness, you know, Shelley, it's not that you used to tell certain people that they were fuckwits, it's that you used to tell them twice just to make sure there was no uncertainty about it. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? There are too many airheads. They have triumphed. We need to let the air out of their hot air balloons. But the funny thing is that there must be something in the human spirit that really responds to the idea of the troublemaker. Think of how many books and films revolve around a protagonist who refuses to toe the line. James Dean, Gregory Peck playing Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird, Russell Crowe in The Insider, Tom Cruise in The Firm, Daniel Craig in Defiance. Think of how many real-life heroes we venerate, from Socrates to Mandela Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Anyone who fought in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there's something in us that yearns to know there are other human beings out there fighting for the right things, standing up against the crowd, just as, as long as they don't do it too close to us. You know, because we'd kind of rather really, you know, prefer it if the troublemakers, would you just stand over there? We wouldn't want to draw attention. We wouldn't want anyone thinking we're friends with you. You have to think about the littlies and the paycheck and what the boss might think. Whenever I've interviewed whistleblowers, they say the same thing. They expected the loathing and the condemnation for them, from their bosses, but they didn't expect to be turned into pariahs by their colleagues, colleagues who also knew what was going on and why it had to be aired. It's a survival in instinct at work, I know, and it's also a herd instinct. Whatever animal strays from the herd is the one that will get picked off by the lions, the cheetahs and the other hunters. Troublemakers peddle dangerous ideas and thoughts. There's a famous maxim, and I can never quite pin down who actually said it. I think William James, the, philosopher, the American philosopher, is the, is the one who turns up most often being as, the, as the originator. But I've also seen a version attributed to Mahatma Gandhi. And it describes how unwelcome ideas and their proponents are treated. And it goes like this. First they ignore you. Then they mock you. Then they attack you viciously. Finally they say, oh, we knew that all along. <laughs> Now, you can stick your head up above the parapet and shout out, but what happens if you're ignored? If people pretend they can't hear you, or indeed if people go out of their way to make sure you aren't heard? I recently wrote a couple of pieces, a short one in The Spectator, and then I wrote it at length in, in um, Quadrant, and it revolved around a new word I'd learned called um, and it's tactic. It's German, and it means death by silence. I learned about it from reading an essay by Geoffrey Wheatcroft on George Orwell, published in The Spectator. And basically, Totschweig tactic is an astonishingly effective way of killing off creative work or fresh ideas or even news stories. It's very simple. You simply don't criticise or engage with what's being said or produced or expressed. Instead, you deprive someone of the oxygen of attention. You just let it all, the work, the person, whatever they're saying, their opinion, you just let it expire soundlessly like a butterfly in a bell jar. In Orwell's case... It was used on his book about the Spanish Civil War, Homage to Catalonia, in which he had revealed the role of Stalin as Moscow. And the left was appalled by his lack of solidarity. He was met with either poisonous abuse, or, as Wheatcroft wrote, 
with what used to be known in Vienna as the Trotschweig tactic death by silence. By the time Orwell died in 1950, the book, which had been first published in 1938, hadn't even sold out its first edition of 1,500 copies, and it only gradually acquired its reputation as one of the 20th century's central political and moral texts. Now, I knew the tactic existed because I had seen it at work on the writing scene with people like Kate herself. I just never knew it had such a chillingly apt name. It works in news as well. I mean, it's a recent example from news. If it hadn't been for the Australian's newspaper, relentless coverage of the rorts in the building the education revolution, along with Ray Hadley, that story would have just died. Every other journalist in town just ignored it. Of course, now, as William James puts it so well in his fourth point, everyone knows that the BER is a major embarrassment for Julia Gillard. Now, I singled out the Australian newspaper there, but obviously there are many times when the Sydney Morning Herald have covered a story extremely well, and maybe the Murdoch Press hasn't. It's just something that you think that a story breaks, everyone's going to cover it, not necessarily. And that, that is exactly how stories die. Now, one of my favourite troublemakers is a British columnist and restaurant reviewer called Giles Corrin, He's Alan Corrin's son, and he's most famous for a terrible email he wrote to the sub-editors of the Times, and when they changed the word in his final sentence, so it both changed the meaning of the sentence and also the rhythm. And his thousand words vitriol was, was leaked. And here's one of the less dreadful paragraphs of that email. He says to the, to the subs who have done this work, I only wrote that sodding paragraph to make that joke, and you've fucking stripped it out like a pissed Irish plasterer restoring a Renaissance fresco and thinking Jesus looks shit with a bear, so plastering over it. <laughs> the subs retorted with their own prissy email and there were other various letter writers pursing their lips. But you know what? There are a number of writers, and I think also a lot, number of people in the public, who just couldn't help cheering because, you know, it's just so wonderfully funny and sharp and basic. The subs asked Corin in their letter, do you have to be so rude? Well, yes, Corrin thought I do. Now, he is famous for his outbursts. And one of his friends said of his tirades, I think it's born of a genuine disappointment that the world doesn't meet his ludicrously high standards. Now, the point of telling this story tonight is that it introduces another obstacle to troublemaking, the new insistence on niceness. Look, Corrin's outbursts are ridiculously intemperate, but they are so refreshing in our new politically correct, sugary, inclusive relativist, consensus-seeking world where we all have to be team players. Corin is not a team player. And of course, I know it's true that honey catches more flies than vinegar, but in the last 30 years, that proverb has been taken to the nth degree. We mustn't be judgmental. We can't upset people. No one must be made to feel awkward. No one can be a failure. If something seems too difficult, too challenging, well, the challenge must be taken out of it. Simplify it. 30 or 40 years of this kind of sugary bromide has meant we've ended up in deep shtuck. If you can't ever say what rot, an awful lot of rot is going to be promulgated. I recently heard a repeat of a terrific interview on the ABC with a French professor, Didier Malheur, who now teaches literature at the University of California. And he was, had been asked to address the question, should museums be inclusive? Well, his short answer was actually no. But he didn't mean it sound like that. Of course he means that museums should be inclusive. Of course they should open their doors. Of course they shouldn't have charges, he was saying. But no, he didn't think that curators should tailor their work to the visitors. He believed that, quote, a museum needs to give people what they need, not what they want. Now, the, unit, the interview was astounded. She kept asking questions like, but if it's about a people's culture, do they know more about it than the museum? And a doozy, so do you think people will still learn as easily in what you might be describing as an old-fashioned museum? To which Monsieur Malheur responded with great Gallic insouciance, I didn't think there was anything old-fashioned about the old-fashioned museum. <laughs> <laughs> we should trust people's intelligence, he assured her. And he handled it extremely well and graciously, but you could sense the Gallic imp impatience stirring. My own impatience was certainly arcing up. So what I reckon is that we need a lot more piss and vinegar. Another reason why you should take away a copy of Kate's book tonight, let me read some of the titles in the collection. Gutless Fiction, Moral Trouble, Bad Manners, The Hypocrisy of Wall Street Culture, Mistakes Too Many to Mention. You get the drift. It's a book for people who love cat fur being dragged backwards. And the real truth is when you're nice to everyone, you turn yourself into a small target if you're never making trouble. So always using honey without any vinegar is actually a cowardly thing to do. The English humanist William Hazlitt is a joy on this. 
He wrote a scalding essay in 1816 on good nature. What a foppish affectation he thought that was. Good nature is the most selfish of all the virtues. It is nine times out of ten mere indolence of disposition. A good-natured man is, generally speaking, one who does not like to be put out of his way. No good-natured man was ever a martyr to a cause. Similarly, I'm always delighted by the stirring words of our own essayist, Walter Murdoch, who wrote early last century, It is pleasant to have troops of friends, but you can hardly feel at ease in your own conscience unless you also know that you have regiments of enemies. The more, the merrier. The planet on which we live is not a place where a man can do the right thing without making enemies. And I seem to have lost the rest of my speech. (laughs) Troublemaking has one more new foe, and this one is bigger than all the rest. It's about a new way of dealing with the world and its unpleasantness, and it's becoming more and more fashionable. It's basically the message, oh, just suck it up. The people who talk like this imagine that by saying it, they are somehow showing how wise they are in the ways of this astonishing 21st century with all its breakthroughs and revolutionary changes. They seem to think it shows that they're superior and that you, by wanting to grumble and kick and scream and generally do everything but not suck it up, why, you're just showing what a naive hick you are. You're a bit of a rube. You belong back in the 20th century with you and your like. I'm currently embroiled in a small insurrection against billionaire Kerry Stokes the details of which are far too complicated and personal to go into, but which revolve around a small group of freelancers deciding that we quite like owning our own copyright and we quite like owning our own houses and bank accounts too, and we're not that keen on indemnifying him every time we write a story. We quite like it the way it's been for centuries, which is where the publisher, the rich, rich, powerful, with legions of lawyers and insurance policies at his disposal, indemnifies the writer. Now, what's really interesting about this dispute, and if we, um, it's basically an agreement, if we don't sign the agreement, we can't write for specific publications any longer. What's really interesting about the dispute is how uninterested many other journalists are, even though the ramifications of what Mr Stokes is asking for may soon come to a desk near them. Oh, said one writer, he does quite a lot of work in business, suck it up. <laughs> this attitude is so much worse than touch fag tactic. I mean, what if you give a party up on your parapet And instead of certain people pretending you're not there, what if no one can even see the point of coming in the first place? Like, you know, what's the problem? In parenthesis, suck it up. (coughs) Is this what happens when a society becomes so used to unfairness and greed and short-term thinking and not thinking about other people that it becomes inured to all this? I mean, I grew up with Edmund Burke and Margaret Meads, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that has. If we stop thinking that nothing can be done, that this is now the way of the world, that people should stop bleating about their missing cheese, if you really think like that, you will quickly find yourself on page 239 of Kate's book, where she writes, and here she's talking specifically about the artificial world of wealthy bankers and their Botox wives, but it applies everywhere, Keep company only with people who behave like conga eels, and after a while, that seems normal. So the next time someone says to you with a superior flush, flourish, oh, suck it up, don't suck it up. Instead, hand them a copy of Kate Jennings' excellent new collection, Trouble. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Shelley. Um, but I want to first thank... Jared and Anne for inviting me here again. Um, I try every time I come to Australia to to do one of their events because of the gala dinner that they invited me to some years ago now, isn't it? Yeah. And um, they called my agent, um, Margaret Connolly, and said, uh, you know, we'd like Kate to be the guest speaker at their gala dinner. And of course, my agent said, well, you know, Kate's very left wing. And they said, well, we know that. Said, we know she doesn't like Mr. Howard very much. Well, we know that. <laughs> and they still invited me. And uh, at that time, because of the very things we're talking about, my old mates on the left were having nothing to do with me. And uh, the few that were actually said, why on earth would you go and talk to all those people, all those bankers? And I said, well, who else am I supposed to talk to? And uh, it, was a, it was a great evening, I must say. It's one, one of the best better evenings of my life, rather peculiar, but rather wonderful. And uh, um, also, I don't know if you know this, but when writers come 
people you sort of get dibs on where you speak. And I was going to speak somewhere else, and, I, and uh, they said, well, you can't speak at the Sydney Institute because you're speaking here. Um, and I said, well, actually, I am going to speak at the Sydney Institute. And really, you know, I don't often cause a fuss, but I, I, I caused a fuss. And um, here I am. And I love Jared and Nan also because they're dog people. <laughs> I've only seen one Border Terrier since I've been here, and I was driving along in the car with my brother, Dare Jennings, and he wouldn't stop the car. I was quite upset. So, anyway, Shelley is a um, good friend, and she's a great editor. I loved working with her. And uh, I also, um, she covers the same beat as I do, which is quite a simple one the infinite ridiculousness of human beings. Um, I'm here in Australia doing the rounds. I've been um, talking now for about a month and a half. So when I go back to New York, I'm taking a 10-year vow of silence, but I'm going to try and do my best now. I just wanted to tell you how the book came about. Um, I'd done a quarterly essay, uh, um, uh, called, I think it was called American Revolution, the, the, the uh, Rise of the Bomber and the Fall of Wall Street. And it was that extraordinary five weeks in uh, 2008. Um, and um, I wrote that in five weeks with my editor, Chris Fike, at the other end in Australia. And we turned it around in four days. And it was an extraordinary experience. We are all writers in search of a good editor. You, you want that editor at the other end. Um, and, she and, and Shelley, for a time, was, was an editor for me. And now I have Chris. I wrote another um, essay for him called on the, on the movie Wake and Fright, and it was the first time I'd gone back to my rural childhood. Um, I'd seen the movie Wake and Fright uh, when it came out in 1970, um, and so back I went into the past. And then it was suggested that I do a book of essays for them, and I thought, mm, essays, you know, dutiful, a bit dutiful. Whenever I get books of essays, I read one or two, and then mm, maybe I go back to them, maybe not. And I thought, well, maybe I can do something else. Um, because I've lived in New York for the last 30 years, I've been a working writer, I haven't got grants. Um, I've covered the waterfront, I've done all kinds of things. And uh, I said, well, why don't I try and put together a book that tells the story of the, ta of the times from 1970 to now. And uh, I've written poetry, I've written essays, um, op-eds. Um, and I thought, I can even put in the parts of my novels that are true. Sorry, you're not hearing? Yeah. At all? Now. now better? Sorry. Oh, God, I can't repeat myself again. <laughs> um, so I would even put in the parts of the, the novels, that, um, the bits that are true. My novels uh, seem to be close to life. I would say they're probably 50% true, and there are bits that are and other bits that are not. Um, I also, in a very small one way, wanted to tell my own story. Um, I do not want to write a memoir. Um, Stanley and Sophie, my, the, my book about my dogs, um, was as close as I want to get to a memoir. Very, very hard to write because you have to write the truth. Um, and the other thing about this book, which is rather marvellous, is it goes back full circle. In 1975, I published a book of poetry and an anthology, groundbreaking anthology of women poets, uh, with Outback Press, and that was Maury Schwartz and three other guys. And Maury Schwartz, of course, is the publisher at Black Ink. And uh, so it's rather delightful, after all this time, to, to close that circle. But the thing I didn't realise in doing this book is that I would have to go back to the past. I mean, you would think this would occur to me, but it didn't. <laughs> and I hate going back to the past. Um, you know, Shelley, I think you out-expleted me, I mean, which, is, <laughs> which is rather marvellous, because I've noticed that the ABC always pre-records me these days. I wonder why. <laughs> um, anyway, I, my story about the past actually is Eddie Fisher was asked... Um, what he thought about putting a gun to Elizabeth Taylor's head when she left him for um, Elizabeth Burton. And he said, the past of us, the past is a son of a bitch. And um, actually, I kind of agree with him. And some of us have pasts that are more sons of bitches than others. And mine's a bit that way. Um, but the other thing, um, 
I, I took three months to do it, which is actually a very short time for a book, but I, because I didn't want to spend any more time in my past. Um, but again, I had Chris at the other end. He, he moderates my moderation. I was able to do it because I had a fantastic editor. And, and doing this book also, going back and looking at all the things I've written, made me remember all the editors that I've had over the years and, uh, and just how important they are, um, the ones that you know, brought out the best in me. I've had someone, some who haven't brought out the best in me, but on the whole, they have. And uh, it, it's the editors who got me, because I, am, um, as the vernacular has it, I'm, I'm idiosyncratic, and Shelley is fair and square on that list. Now, the title Trouble actually didn't come from... Actually, it came from one of my own poems in the book, it, it, and the line was my only... Talking about my... Um, old mates from university that they say that my only talent is for causing trouble um, and that's been a bit the case over the year, years uh, my husband's mother once chided me uh, when I was whinging about the cost of putting myself on the line yet again she actually said where else would you put yourself <laughs> and she was a beautiful tough no nonsense Cuban woman who worked in the settlement houses in Cincinnati and she voted for Eleanor Roosevelt. So what lines have I put myself on?